Good morning. There's an interesting iPhone feature that I don't know if you have on your phone. If, well, if you don't have an iPhone, you don't have it. But there's an interesting feature that when you're texting with someone, you have an idea or a knowledge as to when they read that text from you. It shows simply underneath it a, a time that it, or it says just simply it's been read. And I don't know about you, but I have always understood that text or in written form so often does not convey the true emotion or tone by which you're communicating with. And so there's moments when you're having a conversation or maybe just even asked a simple question, but that question has some weight behind it. And you see that your text has been read, but there's no response. And, and with an iPhone, you actually have another little feature where these little bubbles on the, uh, the part of the person you're communicating with start to, to bounce across where, they're gonna, where their text is going to come from. And, and you see these bubbles, and sometimes it just goes on and on and on, and then there's nothing. And you're like, what are, what are they thinking? And then the worst is when the, the bubbles start to come across the screen, and then they just go away. And you're sitting back thinking, what, what do they think right now? And your mind goes to all these places of, of where it could be and, and how now things are just spinning out of control and, and how conflict is coming into the situation when you have really no idea what the other person's thinking. There's something I say to our staff and I say in leadership development frequently, in the absence of communication, negativity always fills the void. In the absence of communication, negativity always fills the void. And I think for many of us here today, we recognize that we have relationships in our life where negativity can frequently creep in. With our classmates at school, with a teacher or a coach, with our coworkers or our boss, with a neighbor or I think even at a deeper level, our spouse. And this morning I recognize that there are, there are realities in our life, especially in marriage, where things don't always play out the way we hope or think they should. And see, like God had a sense of humor when he thought, hey, the best way for, for me to, to articulate my character and the relationship I will have with my creation, the, the image bearers who were created in my image, the best way to demonstrate that character is I'll take two people with very different backgrounds who see the world completely different, who have their own idiosyncrasies and have their own bad habits, I'm going to throw them together, and I'm going to now have them <laughs> try to walk through all these high expectations they have of one another, and let me throw in the heat and the pressure of all the day-to-day -day realities and stress. And we're going to call that good. We're, we're going we're gonna to see that be a reflection of me. And most of us would sit back and say, Corey, there's really nothing humorous about that. But here's the thing. God intended for that kind of relationship to be lived in such a way that it would reflect him. And so this morning, if you're sitting back thinking, huh, 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 the relationships in my life are far from reflecting God in my life. Well, I just want to talk to you a little bit this morning that I realize that this conflict and discord, this friction so often in our life, well, hear me, conflict is really not the problem. The way by which we handle the conflict is the problem. Right, conflict is going to come. If you are married, if you have a relationship with someone over a long term, you're going to get hurt. Why? Because we have a human nature about us that have emotions attached to it where those emotions are constantly changing. But the reality of it is not the conflict itself, but how we deal with it. See, I, I want to speak with some grace this morning because I don't know everyone's story. But, but when I was reading some statistics on marriage, which I like data, I like the stats, and, and sometimes they can be a little overwhelming. But even when I asked Siri to confirm some things, her average was actually higher than the study I was reading. When, when I look at those stats, I realize the number one cause in America for divorce is what? Irreconcilable differences. Now hear me. There's no such thing. Okay? 
There's no such thing as irreconcilable differences, just irreconcilable people. Okay? Like, like, like I want to I wanna speak with some grace and some mercy here because you may be saying, hey, Corey, that's my story. Like, that's, that's what I've been through. And, and I know there were irreconcilable differences. No, one second. If you were to tell me that if the person in which you were claiming irreconcilable differences with had demonstrated more maturity, had demonstrated a, a higher social and relational IQ, if they would have demonstrated a greater ability to show you maturity as a woman or a man, would you have ended up in the same place? See, I would tend to believe if you had to write on your divorce papers that we are too immature and too socially handicapped to address our conflict, if you like had to write out, I am too immature to handle this person, I don't think that would be the leading cause of divorce anymore. Like, I don't know that I would be willing to put down that because I have to grow up and I have to mature, um, I might pause long enough to recognize that, wait a minute, maybe, just maybe, there is no difficulty too great if I'm willing to work through it together. If I'm willing to recognize God's fingerprint in the midst of this, God's leadership over my marriage, over my relationships, regardless of where they are, maybe, just maybe, it wouldn't be irreconcilable, but reconcilable. See, I, I believe too many married people are moving from I do to I'm done because they haven't been able to figure out how to work through normal, everyday stresses and conflict. Life just comes with them. And here's the thing, those clashes, those, those conflicts have a tendency to begin to mount. Right? And you'd say, well, Corey, some of them are just too insignificant. Like they're just too small. But the problem is, is conflict going unresolved, regardless of how big or small it is, just have a tendency to stack up to the point now they feel too irreconcilable. They're, they're too overwhelming. They're, they're coming at us now because of the weight of how many things that have gone unreconciled. It's crushing. Insurmountable. And what happens? Couples just quit. I think it's actually a better picture of couples actually just drive another nail into the life of the person they're in conflict with. Let me show you a picture of what that nail does. If you would, watch this. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me, and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop they, trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail. See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just sometimes it's like there's this achy. I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! Try to see things my... It's not about the nail. But here, here's the thing. I think it is. Like, like, because we find so many nails getting driven in to those we say we love all the time because of our inability to address conflict. And this morning, I realized there are a number of passages, and one specifically I'm going to deal with today, and, and then I'm going to begin to unpack even more when family month gets here. 
that at the beginning of August, we're going to look deeper at marriage and look deeper at parenting and looking deeper at the, the way we see relationships around our life. And, and I want you to realize today, as I kind of give you a glimpse of that, that the Apostle Paul, I believe, there's some principles he can bleed, meaning some things I think he can write from a place or a perspective that he has a, a heart for others to understand to truly know. He uses language like, I urge you, I beg of you, and he's trying to get people to realize the difficulty of unresolved conflict. And see, if you have a nail in your marriage, how you deal with that nail will determine the health of your marriage. If you have a nail in your relationship with coworkers or a boss, how you deal with that nail parents with your children, children with your parents, when there are nails there, how you deal with those nails will ultimately determine how healthy that relationship is. A classmate, teacher, coach, neighbor. And we get some great godly guidelines of handling conflict when we read Paul writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4. And, and hear me, y'all hear me say this all the time, that context is Everything. And, and for those of you that are guests this morning, just know I asked that question a lot. Context is, and, and it's everything. And I realize in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul's not writing about conflict in his marriage. One, he wasn't married. Two, it's just not a context of marriage. It's not a context of workplace. Like Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about conflict in the church. Okay? Um, but let me help you understand why conflict in the church matters as Paul writes this. We cannot expect to handle conflict in the church properly if we're not handling it properly in our home. Like recognize, all the dysfunction in the church doesn't begin here. It begins with whatever happened out there that you brought in with you. Like, Corey, there's just too much quarreling. Like, there's fighting in the church. That didn't start here. It started with people who have begun to mature handle conflict, and it's dysfunctional, and it's broken, and they bring that mindset into the body, and we hope and we pray that it'll work out okay. And Paul's saying, unfortunately, no, no. He gives us another thought that before I get to Ephesians chapter 4, I think he gives us um, a foundation which to build upon, understanding why what he says in Ephesians chapter 4 carries so much weight, is because when he talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he says so clearly that, look, um, you who are in Christ, you're new creations. The old is gone, the, the new has come. And in verse 18, he says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. What's he saying? I implore you. I am begging of you to recognize who you are, as a child of the king, who you are in Christ, you are new in this living. You are new in this life. You're not like you were. You're not that old self. You're new. And in being new in Christ, I recognize what he's done for you. I recognize what he's done for me. And what he did was demonstrate grace upon the cross. Like, like he's trying to help them understand not what God is doing, what he's done. That sets up the tone and foundation of what he's doing now. And he says so clearly, um, this is how we treat one another in the church. This is how we handle divine problems, issues, conflicts that arise in our life. Now, let's be honest, though. Just keep in mind, it, we're never going to handle problems and conflict and difficulties in the church if we don't understand how to do them in our home. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 this morning in verse 25 as Paul writes. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come from your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I'm not big into formulas. I'm not big into top lists. But, but when I read this, I can't help but see that Paul is pointing to a number of primary principles that are really important for you and I not just to read and, and not just to kind of give some attention to, but understand and apply. And I believe if you're going to be faithful or you're going to be diligent with addressing conflict in your life, there are some biblical principles here you must hold on to. And that first biblical principle you've got to be committed to, number one, is telling the truth. What does he say in verse 25? Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. There is a very simple principle here that um, I don't want you to think that I, um, I think you to have a lower IQ. But hear me. Lies always keep things in the dark. Lies always keep things in the dark. Truth always brings things into the light. Like it's a principle that like if you don't believe that or you don't know that, let me just tell you, the scriptures are going to confirm it over and over. Truth puts things in the light. And, and everything, hear me, Everything is easier in the light. See, Paul's making the implication here that what? Lies hurt, right? Since we are in Christ, right? We are one body. So when you hurt someone else with a lie, you're hurting yourself. Catch that. When I hurt you with, with something that's not true, I'm hurting me. And whatever hurts one part of the body hurts the whole body. Like, have you ever in the middle of the night or even in the broad light of day ever kicked the bedpost with no shoes on with your little pinky toe? Like, you ever kicked that door jam accidentally? Or last night... Before I went to bed, we've got, and some of you are going to think, man, he has a circus. And we do. And they're all my monkeys. But we have three dogs. And unfortunately, none of them were as small as I had hoped for. But, but last night, I'm, I'm, I'm laying on my bed, but I have my, foot, my leg over on the side of the bed. And, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm watching something. And, and my spastic middle dog, Reese, just comes flying through the door, as he always does. And he's a fairly big dog. And and I have my leg on the side, and he just thinks that's open game for something to lick. And he just comes right and runs right into my foot. And I'm just sitting, I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, like, like just this, this feeling that all he hit was my toe. Everything else hurt. And sometimes you might think that it's just something small and insignificant, but it doesn't just hurt that person, it, it hurts you too. See, but understand, the command here is not to lie. What's the command? To tell the truth. Why? Because truth unifies. Lies divide. And you will never be able to trust someone where there is no truth. You just can't. I say this to the staff all the time. If we don't have trust for one another, we don't have anything. It's the foundation by which everything else is built on. 
But there's a certain way that we tell the truth he talks about here. What? In love. Ephesians 14 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who, has, who is the head into Christ. Let me just help you for those of you that think, well, I always tell the truth. You never use the truth as a club. Right? If you think that, oh, I always wield truth, and, but you beat people with it. Um, you are never persuasive when you are abrasive. That'll tweet, by the way. <laughs> You're never persuasive when you choose to be abrasive. I love what John MacArthur says here. He says, truth without love is brutality. Truth without love is brutality, but love without truth is nothing more than sentimentality. And we've got to be committed to telling the truth what wrapped in love. At the core of truth is a desire to cover it with love. That stat I was telling you about earlier, that when I was reading this, the data, and, and I even asked Siri, um, the, the percentage of spouses that lie to one another on an ongoing, regular basis. The report I was reading said 71% lie to their spouse on an ongoing, regular basis. Siri said it was 74. Think about that for a second. You say, well, I don't, I don't think that's me or my marriage. Understand, lies come in very different packages, right? I can lie by exaggeration. You're always in a bad mood. You always have a headache. You never listen to me. You never do what I've asked. And all of a sudden, we begin to use language like never and always. And we begin to talk in terms that, again, something I say frequently, when you make the problem about the person, you miss the heart of the problem. Keep conflict on the issue, on the problem. Don't make the conflict about the person. Because what happens? Um, when I lie by exaggeration, well, I begin to question their whole perception of the relationship. But I can also lie by retaliation, right? They hurt me so deeply, I'm justified in creating a lie about them. Like if you knew what they did to me, you wouldn't care if all I did was share a little mistruth about who they are about what they do. You can lie by, well, what? Evasion. I call it fire escape lying. Because I've got caught in the midst of something, I will quickly or instantly come up with something that will allow me to evade this situation because if the truth really comes out in this moment, I think to myself, then, then I'm going to be caught, I'm going to be in trouble. And, and so what will we do? We'll instantly come up with something that will communicate an exaggeration or an outright lie in order to cover myself. We have a truth, hear me, a truth, a chance to, we have a chance to stand on truth in our marriages, in our relationships when I speak truth. But hear me, what happens when I stand and speak truth, what I'm doing is, is I'm inviting God into the situation. What did Jesus say so clearly? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when I speak truth, I'm inviting him into the situation. But when I choose to speak a lie, who am I inviting in? Satan's, one of his titles or characteristics, the father of lies. So I have to ask myself, in this moment where there is conflict, who am I choosing? Who am I willfully accepting place in this conflict? Am I saying I'm going to invite Satan into the midst of this, or am I going to invite the Father who desires to bring life into this, or the enemy who desires to bring darkness into it? Well, hear me. I get it. There's someone here today saying, but PK, I... I only told a lie so I didn't hurt the other person. Well, first of all, 
That's a lie itself. You chose to tell a lie because you didn't want to hurt you. Right? You're lying for your benefit, not theirs. Because the Bible says that when you lie to your spouse, you're demonstrating your hate for them. Look at Proverbs 26, verse 28. A lying tongue hates those that it hurts. And a flattering mouth works ruin. You lie because you love you, not because you love them. PK, if I, if I tell the truth, they may hate me. Like, if I tell the truth, they may reject me. If, like, if I, if I tell the truth, then I don't know what's going to happen. There's a principle I'd love for you to hear this morning, and I hope that you really never forget. And it's kind of interpreted however you want or, or kind of written out however you want, but hear me. When I speak truthfully to my spouse, God begins to work. The Spirit begins to move. When I speak untruthfully to my spouse, the enemy begins to work and the enemy begins to move. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. But I think resolving conflict in a healthy way also requires the biblical commitment to number two, controlling our temper. See verse 26, there at the beginning it says, be angry and do not sin. Notice he says here, do not get mad. Understand, anger is a natural response. It's, a, it's a, an emotion in our life that is hardwired into each one of us. And I think there's something to be said that righteous anger actually demonstrates what we care about. Remember when Jesus got so angry when he went into the temple and he saw them selling their wares there in the temple, the temple foyer and he starts flipping over the tables? Like there was a righteous anger that was taking place for the cleansing of his temple. But there's so sometimes I don't think that we understand what kind of anger is coming out of us. But I think many times we do. Be angry and do not sin. And God says, listen, it's possible to get angry and not sin, right? And there's times in our life where anger is absolutely appropriate but it must be appropriately handled. Like, I don't get justified to just wield anger. No. We can't allow anger to lead us to places we shouldn't go. And that's what Paul's trying to teach here. Look at what he says. Do not let your anger lead you into sin. In Proverbs 29, verse 11, it says, Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Someone said, uh, it's, they, it's, they wrote this, I don't know who it is, but they wrote, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever forget or regret. Speak when you are angry and you'll make the best speech you will ever regret. Ever been there? Ever wished, man, if I just waited, like if I just paused, if I just... Instead of reacting in a moment where I let my rage dictate outcomes. And we'll think it's justifiable. And we'll think our sinful response is, is adequate. Because sin done to you, hear me, it doesn't, doesn't justify um, you doing sin. And there's many times though feeling angry is absolutely appropriate, but sin is never okay. Let me, let me I, 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 this is a real story in our life. I, we've got a 23-year-old daughter, and, and she's learning to grow up. Like, she's, she's now living outside of dorms and living outside of the university and now has different roommates in her environment where she's living in a home off campus. And, and she's beginning to realize that um, they're not alike. And they all view the world around them very, very differently. And there are moments where my daughter, because, man, she is she's hardwired in ways to, to see. I think she kind of got my justice gifting. Like she sees injustice and cannot let it go. 
But there's a part of being wired with this sense of injustice or, or what I know to be spiritually like prophecy, seeing something that is wrong and being miserable unless I address it, that I think there's a part of her that feels like, hey, I've got to tell mom and dad everything that's happening in my world. And there are moments I'm like, honey, 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 the emotional brain damage that you're causing yourself with your inability to let some things go is only hurting you because your roommates don't care. Folks, there are some things in our life we let go. There's some things in our, they're just battles that are not worth fighting. The problem is, is the discernment to tell between the two. Some problems and conflict in your marriage is about your personal perception or your personal opinion, but it's not worth going to battle over. But also, I believe resolving conflict in a healthy relationship, there's a biblical commitment to keeping stuff current. See the second part of verse 26? And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. This is a simple and poetic way of saying that anger, the reason it's so powerful and the reason it's so dangerous is that time allows it to become like concrete. And first in your own heart and then with your spouse. It's just simply best not to go to bed when you're angry with one another. You ever heard the expression, time heals everything? There is a Greek word for it, and it's called baloney. <laughs> time heals nothing. The only thing time does is give you perspective. But time doesn't heal anything. It doesn't fix pain. Time actually tends to intensify anger. It multiplies anger. And what Scripture's telling us in this moment is simple. Don't transfer your anger into tomorrow. Why? Because it accumulates interest. And now anger turns into something more sinister. It starts to begin to turn into bitterness. And Paul says it gives place, or what, a foothold to the devil. It's like opening the door and saying, Father, either come and do your work, or opening the door and say, Enemy, come and do yours. Who are you inviting into the situation? And what's he saying? Solve the problem today. Isn't it like the enemy, though, to like bring up this hurt in our marriages at like 9.30 p.m.? Like, PK, we had a really good day until. Like the enemy to bring up conflicts in the last period. Conflict in the last hour of work on a Friday. Um, let me just speak to the marriage side of this. It's worth you going all night to resolve the conflict than it is for the next week with it unresolved. And so what happens so often when we go to bed at night angry with the other, one, we don't really go to bed. We actually begin to think about it in ways that intensify this bubble on the screen, not knowing what the other's going to say. And now we feel as if they're not saying anything at all, but I know they heard me, and I'm just left on red. And that makes me angrier. Like, did they not hear me? Like, did... oh, if they didn't hear me, I'm going to make sure they hear me. Like, did, do they not feel what I feel? Oh, they're going to feel something. Like, like in all of this unspoken time, the enemy just starts working in ways that bitterness and anger that now turns to rage and wrath.
Keep it current. Resolve conflict a healthy way requires biblical commitment to number four, guarding our tongue and our tone. What does he say in verse 29? Let no corrupt word proceed out of our mouth. Let me just say this real quick, and I'll keep going. This isn't in my notes, but I just feel like it needs to be said. If you're using foul language to describe your spouse, that's wicked. Like, like that, that has Satan written all over it. So if your language toward the person you're one flesh with, you're actually speaking what you think about you. Remember, you're speaking about an image bearer of the king that God loves just as much as he loves you. And now when you speak against that image, you're actually speaking about its creator. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that is right, that, that might impart grace to the hearers. What does the word corrupt mean? It means rotten. It means bad, worthless, useless, harmful. He says, don't let these words come out of your mouth. Remember context. He's dealing with conflict in the church. We're making the assumption or the understood rule that if you're not practicing it in the home, you won't practice it in the church. So take this to the nth degree that when he says don't say this to a brother and sister in Christ in the body, don't say it to the one you're one flesh with. Like you gotta work it back to the, to the natural end of the conversation. If it's harmful, useless, worthless, rotten, bad, don't let it come out of your mouth in the midst of conflict. But rather what is helpful. It's beneficial, what's constructive to the situation. Hear me, this is not that you don't state what you really feel. No. But use words that are mindful enough to keep it about just that. You can't communicate a feeling about a problem when you've just described the person as someone who's unworthy to know the problem. So I'm going to use words that are helpful, beneficial to the situation, that will bring further clarity to the moment. Words that will not set it on fire. You might sit back and say, but they don't deserve that. Wait a second. They don't deserve that I speak words of healing. They don't deserve that I speak words that are beneficial. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's called grace. Grace isn't deserved. Grace isn't earned. You're giving what they undeservably need. What you received from Jesus Christ yourself, it was undeserved grace. Because there's a real temptation that when you get wounded, the temptation is to wound back. Right? You hurt me, I hurt you. Eye for an eye kind of relationship. And our flesh begins to creep in and it says, I don't deserve this. If they think they can do that to me, they're not getting away with it. They're, they're crazy. I'll show them. I'll teach them. Remember, the goal in conflict is not for you to win the argument. The role in conflict is, it for, is for it to be resolved. The question is, what do you want to resolve? Your marriage or the conflict? And then it gets real. Like, 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 Corey, can you just keep it on the church? Because I can handle conflict in here. Stop taking it home with me. Why, you are. Like, like, like let's just be real enough to look at this. The Bible says so much when it says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise bring healing. Or a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Maybe this one should be a prayer for us today. Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth. Keep, keep a watch over the doors of my lips. In my married life, I'm not certain 
if I have caused more conflict by what I have said or at times caused more conflict by what I've not said. And if you can't see the tension in that, maybe you've not really examined what conflict looks like in your marriage. But see, I think lastly, number five, Resolving conflict in a healthy way requires a biblical commitment to number five, giving our forgiveness. Look at verse 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Charles Spurgeon said about this, let us go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven. Then let us linger there to learn how we forgive. Let me say that again. Let us go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven and let us linger there to learn how we may forgive. I think it's easy to say that our marriage is bigger than us. Right? It's a visible picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Hold on. Here's where some of you might forget the entire message I just preached and now step back and say, all the the things that get said about me. Um, When you claim irreconcilable differences, uh, when you claim that your marriage is uh, unable to be healed, when you, when you claim certain things, hear me, um, you're saying to the world that the King of kings and Lord of lords, your Savior, your Christ, was not big enough to bring healing. Like, 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 hear me. I, I'm going to say the truth and cover it in love. I could avoid this completely and tell you it doesn't matter. Your marriage and its testimony says to a hurting and dying world that your marriage is covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now hear me. The reason why Scripture is so clear about not marrying someone who is an unbeliever to your belief, they can't do this. They can't even understand what you're going to to find healing in your marriage. So they will work from a completely different perspective that cannot find healing in the midst of your desire for healing. Why? Because you're speaking grace that you know has been extended to you that they've never met. But Corey, I'll get them to come to Jesus. Not before you say, I do. Because if you say I do and they're still an unbeliever, what you've said is, um, my will's greater than his. Like, God, I know your plan, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over here. And then for some reason, three, five, six, eight years into a marriage, you're calling your pastor to say, Pastor, we've got a problem. I said, yeah, you had it day one. But I couldn't tell you that because... You were in love. Pastor, you don't understand. They're dreamy. Like, they're perfect. Like, like I know that's who God has for like, like, I just, um, the heart can be deceitfully wicked. That's scripture. And if you're having trouble with a spouse, a boss, a parent, any other person for hurting you, Can I suggest this morning that you write out the top five worst things you've ever thought, you've ever done, you've ever said? The top five worst things imaginable in your life. And then sit back and consider what God forgave you of. If God could demonstrate grace over these things that that I'm guilty of, then maybe, just maybe, because I've experienced his grace, I'll extend it to the thing you're guilty of right now. 
when you compare what that person's done against you, compare it to what you've committed against God. And here's what I'll guarantee you. You will never, you will never, you will never forgive more than God has forgiven you. Just, just won't. He's already forgiven you. And hear me, it's going to cost you something to forgive them. But it will never cost you as much as it cost God the Father to forgive you. Never. And we forgive because we've been forgiven. And you can see a marriage survive in conflict. Well, let me just say this. In the church, we have to. So when I, when I counsel couples, when I meet with couples, I can't see the clock, so I don't know what time it is. Um, uh, when I count, I really can't. So when I, when I counsel couples, I understand so frequently, I rarely ever go back and try to unpack things. Do you realize you can actually cause more damage when people ruminate over the past? Like, like, like I want to know what is right now and what is current and what does God's word have to say about it in a way that you can walk out knowing it's not the counselor's perspective or his opinion. It's a promise that God has given to you in your marriage to say, um, he is still sufficient and he is still good. He is still for you. He's not abandoned you. He's not for, like, like you, you have to understand the character of God in the midst of your conflict. Why? Because you're an image of him. And when I begin to see myself the way God sees me, I begin to change my perspective in how I see you. And listen, when I look out here every Sunday morning, I see a lot of dumpster fires. I know you're hurt. I get a front row seat to your conflict, to your hurt, and I will go home this afternoon knowing how many marriages here right now are hurting and broken because you've told me how many people are sick, how many people are hurting, how many people have lost their jobs, how many people are going bankrupt, how many people are losing their children. I will go home today knowing if you can't understand the promise of God's word, you don't have a chance. Nothing in this world will bring healing to your marriage, to your relationships, if you don't know the word of God. I love the fact, and I don't say this to speak of myself, but the USA Today report like three weeks ago came out, the number one most difficult job in America is that of a pastor. Why? Because I carry all of you. And if I can't help you deal with conflict, I have to resign myself to believing all of this is for nothing. The church can't survive as you bring life that's lived out there into this place and we ask there to be unity. So I'll stand up here and tell you some things that you sit back thinking, he doesn't understand. Oh, so much more than you could believe. He doesn't know. I know a lot more than you think. And so what do I do? I can't tell my wife because I can't have her think about you, what I'm carrying, because that changes the way she worships. I can't tell my staff, because they begin to look at you as someone maybe they don't want to do ministry with. The loneliest place to be is a pastor in his own church. Why? Because we care deeply about those that God's put in our care. And so this morning, I just simply plead with you, if you've got conflict, find a healthy way to practice biblical principles and resolve it. Corey, we've tried everything. Have you found a prayer partner yet? Because I don't know the last time I saw a husband grab a wife's hand and come up here and find someone to pray over their marriage. I don't know the last time that somebody said, Corey, our marriage needs so much healing. Will you call the elders together and anoint us with oil and pray over our marriage? Corey, I don't know the last time that, that I called and said, Corey, I, I need someone. I, actually, I don't want it to be you, but can you give me someone? I have three different, three different phone numbers I can call of organizations that will provide you biblical, godly counseling that today, if you say, Corey, I can't afford it, we'll pay for it. Church, if there was ever a need for benevolence, it's for your marriage. Pay for it. Why? Because the, 
The life of the church counts on your home and your marriage being healthy. Would you stand with me this morning? And I'm going to ask our prayer partners if they would to step out and begin to make their way forward. I'm even going to ask even some of our elders if they would step out and come forward as well because if there are men here today that need prayer over their marriage, I'm going to ask them to be man enough to invite their wife forward to be prayed over by one of our elders. If you're saying, hey, Corey, I'm here today because I have a spouse that won't join me here. We'd like to pray for you. Corey, I'm here today because I have an unbelieving family member that I just can't get along with right now. We'd like to pray with you. Corey, I'm here today because I just don't see a way for this to, to mend itself. We'd like to pray for you. And if you walk out the door today and even if you've received prayer and you're like, hey, there, there must be something more, then we'd like to come alongside of you. Corey, I need somebody in my life that will challenge me on an ongoing basis to live holy. We'd like to partner you with a mentor. It's called discipleship. Or maybe today you just need healing because you're hurting. You're walking through a season where you say, PK, this message is great and thanks and all, but that's not me today. I just, I'm just hurting. For those of you that may be unaware, the, the Billings family, Jill Billings, who's our executive director, her husband, Randy, who's one of our elders, their daughter-in-law, they lost their son this week. When he passed away this week, I recognized the, the depth of sorrow that stepped into their story. And we'll come alongside of them as if well, just like we want to come alongside of you. And we want to do ministry in your life. Why? Because that's the church. That's why we gather. Heavenly Father, this morning, would you work in a way, Lord, that brings healing? Father, would you begin to resolve conflicts that, Lord, seem unresolvable in the, in the economy of this world? Lord, this morning in this place, will you begin to bring healing in such a way that it makes no sense, Father, but yet the calm in the hearts, the peace in the minds that, Lord, begins to, to flow over us because we recognize who you are, what you've done, and what you still desire to do. Father, in this place, will you bring a healing that doesn't make any sense? If, Father, when we consider what's been done to us, Lord, would you meet that with what you've done for us? Where would grace be the picture of this place today? Father, would mercy flow out of this place today? Father, would you receive glory and honor as conflicts begin to fade away as we speak truth in love, as we bring things from the dark into the light? Lord, as we seek healing and mending in the broken areas of our lives, in the broken areas of our relationships, and see you 